I make radio programs about food, and I'm fascinated by the long tradition of people from outside of the kitchen who've asked us to reflect and think again about our relationship with food. From Michael Pollan uh, today, and way back 200 years ago to Bria Savarin, the first speaker at MAD4 is part of that tradition. He is a British thinker and writer, and his book, The Virtues of the Table, is an invitation to us all to ask big questions about the food we eat and how we cook. So please welcome Julian Bagini. Thank, thank you very much indeed. It's absolutely incredible to be here. And it's always a bit nerve-wracking giving a talk. It's always a bit nerve-wracking talking about philosophy, actually, because when you're talking about philosophy, you're trying to steer a kind of path between saying what is completely obvious and what is complete bullshit. And the problem is that that path is often a very, very narrow one. And when you're talking about food and philosophy, well, then I think the, the gap becomes even smaller, you know? Uh, because you know, the, the thing is about philosophy is the danger is you end up going up into the clouds, into sort of abstractions which have nothing to do with real life at all. Whereas uh, when you're talking about food, you're talking about something which is very, very grounding. You know, it involves the very basic things of existence. And so if you start to intellectualize about food, and you get too far away from uh, the reality of everyday life, you soon get exposed. And I'm going to have a go anyway. And what I'm um, talking about today is actually uh, the theme of you know, what is cooking, but also I'm going to talk about uh, conviviality. Now, this is quite uh, perhaps surprising start to a discussion on both conviviality and what is cooking, because I don't know if you know what this is up here, but uh, this is a glass of Soylent. I don't know if you, how many of you have heard of Soylent. Soylent is basically a kind of powdered preparation which is meant to give you all the nutrients you need. You, you mix it with water and you have it, and it means you don't have to really worry about meals anymore. Uh, you've got everything you need to survive in that glass, take it three times a day, get on with life. Uh, now, there are lots of scary things. I mean, people interested about food, the whole idea is instantly, I think, sort of like almost sort of frightening. And there are lots of things that are dubious about it. Actually, from a nutritional point of view, the actual premise behind Soylent is dubious because the idea is that you, if you can work out what the key nutrients are that a human being needs and then you create each individual one and then you mix them up, you will therefore have a healthy food. That's actually somewhat dubious because I think there's a lot of evidence that it's not just about those little packets of nutrients, it's the way in which they all fit together. How we absorb them and digest them and process them is going to depend upon the form in which they come. But even setting that aside, I think a lot of us will feel there's something fundamentally wrong about Soylent. And what is it? Well, the person who invented Soylent, this guy called Rob Reinhardt, he said a few things about this and, and why it's good. And he says that in the future, we'll see a separation between our meals for utility and function and our meals for experience and socialization. And he put it even more pithily another time. He said, I see a difference between eating and dining. So you can see where he's going with this. His idea is really that uh, most of the time, what you want to do is just you know, refuel. And Soylent is meant to be healthy, easy, and convenient, and much cheaper as well than what most people eat most of the time. But when I sort of heard those words, it, it, it kind of reminded me of something. It reminded me of a very famous quote by Briat Savaran, who said that animals feed and humans eat and that only a creature of intellect knows really how to eat. And I thought, now there's a distinction which I think is a very important one. So you've got Reinhardt saying distinction between eating and dining, and you've got Briat Savaran's distinction between eating and feeding. And I think really uh, what's going on here is that Reinhardt thinks that what Savarat calls eating, which is not merely feeding, not merely refueling, is something that we only really do on special occasions. We might occasionally want to go to a restaurant and have something really nice. But most of the time, 
we're just eating, which to him means we're just feeding. Now, I think this is worth thinking about because I think this really gets to the heart of a very mistaken idea about the role that food has in our lives as human beings. And this obviously will relate to cooking as well because if you think there's a difference between feeding, merely refueling, and eating, as in, you know, eating in that fuller sense, then there's also a difference between cooking and preparing. There's a difference between cooking food to be eaten and simply preparing something like Soylent to feed you with. And I think if we, it's good to understand what that difference is if we want to understand the role cooking plays in our lives. Well, what is the difference then between eating and feeding? Well, I mean, in broad terms, I think we all get an easy, intuitive sense of what that difference is. Feeding, you take food, you put it in your mouth, it goes through your stomach, and it ends up in a sewer, to put it crudely, right? When you're eating, on the other hand, you take that food, what are you doing with it? Well, actually what's happening, I think, in eating is, to put it perhaps a little bit romantically, is it's about mind, body, heart, and soul coming together in some way. When you're really eating and not just feeding, what humans do when they gather to eat does, in a, in, in, and I'm not exaggerating, so I think involve their whole being in a way. And I want to get some sense of what that means, what it means for a human being to eat in a way which really brings everything about human life together and isn't just about feeding. Now, this is where conviviality begins to come in. Because obviously when people think about the aspects of eating, which are more than just feeding, they often immediately think about uh, the conviviality of a lot of eating. And this is a very famous painting by Bruegel, uh, The uh, Peasant Wedding. And this is a typical sort of like representation, if you like, of the fact that a lot of the time when we eat, it's about social occasion, it's about celebration, it's about sharing, it's about hospitality, it's about being together with people, it's about joy and so forth. And I think we all kind of know that and this is often sort of said as a sort of like a justification for placing some importance on food. And what's interesting about this scene as, as well of course is that it's, it's a peasant wedding. And I don't know, I mean in Britain I think there is still, despite everything, a certain suspicion of, of taking too much concern over food and eating. And you know, when I wrote my book on this, a lot of people, the first question they would ask is, all this stuff you're talking about food, and particularly getting philosophical about food, you know, this is just kind of some middle class indulgence. This is the kind of phrase they would use. And you know, for most people, eating is actually about survival. And how can you talk about anything else about food uh, when we've got this situation? I think that's fundamentally mistaken, because of course it's true that there are people for whom there is a real survival issue around food. But throughout history, over the world, in every culture, even the poor have always seen eating as being much more than just about staying alive. There is always like feasting, and celebration, even amongst the poorest people. In fact, some of the greatest hospitality people have reported receiving on their travels is often from people who have very little themselves, but will share with a stranger and with a traveler. I think that's just a very important corrective to that idea that what we're talking about here is something that only a privileged few people can talk about. But this idea of conviviality and the, you know, the, the archetype of, of conviviality being the large gathering and the sociability of it, that's true, but I think that well, I want to focus a little bit on something a bit wider than that. I want to take the idea of conviviality and really expand it. Now, in general, when it comes to understanding words and concepts, I'm always a little bit suspicious of looking back to etymology, but in this case, I think it really does work quite a lot, quite well. The origins of this word come from the Latin, and there's com, which is together, vivere, which is to live. Now, what's interesting, actually, is that the words that are formed in, you know, historically when those things came together actually are, in a sense, a bit more than the sum of the parts. Because live together, it's just a descriptive, plain thing. But convivere is to carouse together, convivium, the noun, to feast. It's like this living together becomes something which is more than just a sort of a functional, dry thing. So the way I'd put it here is, for me, conviviality is, is the art of living together, not just in the sense of rubbing along or with mutual toleration, but with a kind of a warmth and a pleasure and a joy. Now, the point 
I want to remake though is that I don't think we should think of that conviviality solely in terms of the archetypal occasion where people gather around a table and talk together. And in fact, you can even see an important aspect of what conviviality in this broad sense means when you think about eating alone. And I want to use an example here, some, some lovely uh, memoirs by MFK Fisher, the great food writer, who, who wrote a few things about the experience of dining alone. And this was an, a woman in like, you know, 1930s America, so you've got to think of how the times were. And she reports how when she'd go out and eat alone, which she did a lot in restaurants, people looked strangely at me, resentfully, with a kind of hurt bafflement when I dine alone. And she resisted that. She saw no reason why she shouldn't, as a single woman, go out and enjoy a meal in a restaurant. And she says, if I must be alone, she accepts that, you know, perhaps the best thing is to be able to share a meal with people you love. But if I must be alone, I refuse to be alone, as if it was something weak and distasteful. Now, I think if you think about, you know, the experience a single person has when they go out and eat in a restaurant or a cafe and the way people look at them, that in itself tells you something about conviviality in the broad sense. The person is eating alone, but if they're made to feel strange for that, if they're not being, uh, they're, they're looked at as weird and, and they're not being served in the same way, and it's as though their pleasure is something they don't have a right to, then in that sense, that's a sort of unconviviality from the people around them. And the person themselves, if they feel awkward, they're not feeling as though they have a place in the world with others, which is okay. They're made to feel out of place. If you as an individual person can, can eat alone and you can have a good, you know, and, and with the waiting staff and the people around you, there is that respect and there's that good interaction and you seem to have the right to enjoy. Then again, although you're eating alone, there is a, a broader sense in which you are still eating in that convivial sense because you are allowed to have your place in the world with others in a way which where there is joy and respect. And I think it's quite interesting, the final thing there, I just thought it was an interesting thought, perhaps a bit overstated, that sharing food with another human being is an intimate act that should not be indulged in lightly. That might be a, a little bit too strong, but I think there's a point there, which is that there is a way in which the kind of conviviality which is most celebrated is something you can only really have with certain people at certain times. And I think if conviviality is an important value, then it's something we should be thinking about as being part of, of eating in a, more, in a broader, much, much broader sense. So the way I want to look at it is this. I want to say that if we take this broad sense of what it means to eat convivially, then whenever we eat, whether we're with people or by ourselves, then we're always, in a sense, should be thinking about the, our place in the world and how that experience relates to people around us. So I'm kind of trying to imagine who's at the table with us, not physically, literally, but in a, in a other important sense. So there is the diner and there is the diners. But, but when you're eating anything, you are living in the world, you're eating in the world, and you have to think of your connections with other people. Not just other people. The first thing to think about is animals. If you're a carnivore or you eat animal produce, dairy products, then the animals who have provided that food are part of that connection of, of, of people you are with, things, creatures you are with. And you can have a good convivial, in that sense, relationship with them or not. If the animals have been reared with respect and treated well, that's a good relationship. If the animals you're eating have been sort of, you know, kept inside in small huts and given a feed and given a miserable life, that's not representing the ideal of that harmonious living and eating together. Of course, there's also farmers and producers. And again, you know, I think that this is something that people ought to think about. If you're sitting down to your food and it's come through suppliers who have no care for the producers and the farmers, and the people making it are just not able to even earn a decent living, send their children to school, have decent sanitation a lot of the time, then in what sense is your, are you really endorsing that value of conviviality? You're, you're failing to sort of live together with others in that way which is about you know, harmonious and, and sharing of joy and so forth. 
Also, of course, this is true of the environment. Now, for some people, the environment is kind of like, almost like a person who they want to have a kind of relationship with. I don't think you need to think about it in those terms. Even if you think about it purely as a kind of resource, it's a resource which we share with other people. So again, if in our eating, we're not mindful of that and we're not aware of that and we're abusing the resource, we're failing to eat in a way which involves that good, you know, living with others in a positive uh, way. And again, there's a failure of conviviality in that broad sense. If you're in a restaurant, it's important also, I think, that all the staff of the restaurant are involved in that. Now, I think this is quite interesting, because if you go back to that, you know, stereotypical scenes of conviviality, you might think of something perhaps from earlier centuries where you have that very, you know, the table set with all the candles and all the different courses and plates and cutlery and everyone's sitting around there having a jolly good time, you know, quaffing their port and their fine burgundy, whatever it might be, and their truffled turkey. And around them, all these people who are serving them, and there's <laughs> those people serving them are from a totally different class. They, they don't get, they're not treated well, really. They work all hours that God sends. And again, this is, I think, the, the shallowest kind of example of conviviality you can imagine, where the group at the table are just feeling, isn't this wonderful? We're all together, and it's all harmonious, and we're sharing the joy. And there's almost like a blindness to the, the way in which the people around them are being served and living. Uh, you know, if that's what conviviality means, then, then I, I don't want any of it. And I think you really notice this. I think if you, you, when you go to restaurants, it, I think it makes a big difference to your experience. We, you never actually know, of course, what's going on behind the scenes. But if you feel that the staff are put upon, that they're not being treated well, they're being overworked, you don't feel comfortable. You, you can't really have that kind of full joy with your companions. On the other hand, when you do get the sense of the opposite, it really does enhance the occasion. And you know, certainly Rene's restaurant at Noma, if anyone has been there, I mean, you, you get a very, very deep sense that everyone there, all the staff there, they, there's, there's such respect and you know, the joy in them, and they, they are sharing in your joy and contributing to it. And that really does help to a, a proper full sense of conviviality. And you can take this idea of, of conviviality even broader, in a sense. You think about the culture, that whenever we eat, in a sense, we are members of a society. And in a way, everything we do is relating to uh, the other people around us. It's all situated. And of course, that also follows around with our ancestors as well. I mean, this is something that's perhaps been a bit lost to a lot of people of my generation, who perhaps, you know, the generation before us, I lost a lot of the cooking traditions. But it's quite a wonderful thing when you can be eating and cooking with an awareness, some sense, that what you're doing is a continuation of something which has been passed down, if not literally by, by your parents, but the generation before you and the generation before that. And that's all part of it. So if you put all these kind of things together, what you really see is that the way you're eating and the way you're expressing or feeling your conviviality is actually a very deep expression of your values and beliefs about the world and food. Actually, everything that you, you, you what you're bringing to the table, your attitudes towards you know, the environment, the other people, the producers, the animals, the stuff, these are deeply moral things and they're involved, I think, every not, not only every time. Obviously, sometimes we do just eat through convenience because we have to and so forth. But I think a lot of the time we either do or we ought to be mindful of these things because it goes back to that distinction. It's because we do these things, it's because eating actually does involve aspects like this that it is eating and not feeding in merely the animal sense. And of course there's one more person here at the table I haven't mentioned which is of course the cook. So this goes back to the theme of, of the uh, symposium which is you know, what is cooking? Everything I've said so far has been about the diner, but of course it's all equally true of the cook. The cook is situated in this network the same as everybody else. They too are related to animals, farmers, producers, ancestors, cultures, earth, and so forth. And their values and beliefs are also deeply part of it. So if a cook is to be genuinely a cook, preparing for eating, and not someone who is merely preparing feed to fuelers, then the cook too is involved in this conviviality in the broad sense. Now there's just one sort of uh, general point I want to make from this. 
which is that this really does relate to this way of thinking about food. To some people, seems like highfalutin. It seems excessive. But the reason why I actually think you know, f- food should be taken seriously philosophically is actually it's a very, very good window into perhaps what is one of the most important questions we have about how to live. If we want to know how to live, we need to understand what kind of creatures we are. And I think that historically, and even in contemporary times, the problem is that we fall into one of two extremes. One, which I think is currently quite dominant, is to say, look, let's just accept it. We are just animals, right? So this idea that, yes, we do just feed. We are just animals. And there's a a song you may have heard which has this line, you and me, babe, we ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel, yeah? That's a zeitgeist idea. And so it's kind of like, yes, let's just be like those those animals there. Um, that, That... just is just so, so, so wrong. And it's not wrong because I have some uh, unrealistic ideal about what humans are. I'm not denying the animality of the human being. But nothing but mammals? Well, here's the proof of it. Even the person who said those words. Have you known any other mammal who will try to seduce another mammal by using music and rhyme? No. <laughs> right? So in the very act of saying that, the, the guy proves it's completely wrong. So when we, when we think we're just animals, we don't do justice to the full richness of our experience. On the other hand, no, we're not angels. We're not spiritual entities in that complete form. Um, We're not just intellects who happen to have the inconvenience of having bodies. We are, to understand how to live, to understand how to live, you understand how we are as human beings. And that understands the way in which we really are, not, not, not a combination of mind and body as though they were two things, but we are mind and body in some kind of real unity. And when you think about how we eat, I think this is a very, very important and very useful way of doing it, because when you think about how we eat, you, you always find it's never really just about feeding, or very re- rarely just about feeding. So you can see how we're more than just animals, but you're always rooted to the physicality. You, you don't get carried away with yourself. So that's the broad point I wanted to make here. So the conclusion I really want to just leave you on here is that I think it's quite obvious that how we eat and cook tells us a lot about how we live with others in the world we share. And that's why it's important to think about that. Now, if you're going to think about the theme of the thing, what is cooking, then I think that cooking as part of that obviously reflects those same things. How we cook tells us about how we live with others in the world we share. And given the idea of conviviality which I've commended to you, which is to think about conviviality not just about that kind of party atmosphere around a table, but that broader sense of how we live together in a way which brings joy and respect to all, then in that sense, at least one part of the answer to the question, what is cooking, is that cooking is a form of conviviality. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.